questions, we're going to move to our next presenter. Uh, we have Mary Rowe. And Mary Rowe is doing uh, the Bay Downtown as a catalyst for downtown revitalization. Uh, Mary is president and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute, an impassioned civic leader and diverse experience in business, government, not-for-profit and philanthropy sectors in Canada and the US for over 30 years. Mary has been a steady advocate and champion for place-based approaches to building livable and resilient cities and community-driven local economies. So we're very thrilled to um, have Mary today. So without further ado, Mary, I'll give you the floor for the next 10 minutes. Cindy, thanks. I'm really pleased to be here. And I can imagine it's a bit chilly in Winnipeg today. Uh, it's cold where I am in Toronto as well, but I can't imagine it's as cold as it would be there. Uh, and I'm actually looking out at my backyard. I got snow happening here in the laneway that I live on. And I'm very pleased though to be having a, a time to have a conversation with you folks. And I'm gonna share my screen, she says, hopefully. Hoping, hoping, hoping that this will work. You never really know, but let's just give it a whirl. Share, is it working? I'm hoping you can see my PowerPoint. Can you, can somebody just give me a thumbs up? Are you seeing a PowerPoint in front of you that says Bay Winnipeg? Yes. Good, all right. I'm an old girl, so I'm happy when these things actually work. So um, 10 minutes, let me just give it my best shot. Um, you know, I feel strongly that we need to um, think about places in unique ways. And that really this is about the power of place. Uh, and Winnipeg is a great place. Um, and the important thing for all of us to think about, I think at this moment is, um, I put this in very small type because it's not a secret, but we never, we never should waste a crisis, which is what we're in. And we're in that across the country. The Canadian Urban Institute is in the connective tissue business. We talk about the future of urban communities across the country and what they're struggling with. And they're all, they're particular, uh, what their struggles are, but there are some common, common challenges. And so much of what COVID has exposed are things that pre-existed before uh, the uh, pandemic, but now have just been uh, exacerbated, or as we describe it, it's acted like a particle accelerator. It's heightened everything, things that were dysfunctional uh, before COVID, um, things that were disconnecting, and we can see that in all sorts of ways, in terms of the way the built environment was constructed, the extent to which it disadvantages uh, racialized communities and communities of color, um, the extent to which we've, dis we've been uh, disconnected from indigenous uh, uh, communities and the history and the legacy of the land here. Toronto, as you know, is the home of, of uh, to many First Nations and uh, across as is every place, as is Winnipeg. And the awareness that we've all had to really suddenly embrace, I think, sadly, um, is uh, sadly that it took us this long to come to terms with the legacies of place, which can be strong and good and can also have detriments. But I think for you folks, as you try to think about the future of the Bay, and we all know of these iconic structures that help us um, differentiate place. It actually allows us to say, oh, I'm not, gee, I'm not in Kansas, I'm actually in Winnipeg. And so each community, each city of every scale have assets like these famous ones um, that signal and send a message about the uniqueness of a place. Um, and this is one that many of you will be familiar with. I'm a fellow with the Shorefast Foundation, which is the beneficiary of this place, which is the Fogo Island Inn. This is a new place. Actually, it's an extremely old place, the Fogo Island itself, but it put together an inn like this and created this iconic, iconic place. And that's the kind of potential that you've got there with the uh, Bay site. And the question for you, and it's not just about the Bay site, it's about all sorts of sites that you have in Winnipeg and in other cities across the country are what is the potential for these to be adapted and reused in really imaginative ways. It's part of the bones of the city. It's part of what makes us who we are. And, and it shapes one of the things I think I'm a spatial determinist. Uh, it's the way in which we, the environment in which we move, live, work, play, recreate, affects our values, it affects our sense of identity and belonging. These are all examples of adaptive reuse that have strengthened a, a, a community's attachment to their place, but also differentiate them from other places. And if you think about cities, cities are about enabling this. This is my 
cute little illustration of what self-organization looks like. Self-organization is about how we enable us as independent agents. If you look at the top of that graph, there's some connection. The middle, more connection. The bottom, a lot of connection. And these kinds of places, iconic places, create opportunities to create the serendipity and the kind of an interchange that place can only places can make happen, actually. This is a sketch that I did uh, on the back of it. It was literally on a napkin, not much better here, and I've been using it for 15 years. I, I watched it happen in New Orleans after Katrina. Some Many of you will know I worked there for six years after Katrina, and I watched to see how would the community reorganize self-organize. And I saw this pattern repeating and repeating and repeating. The communities look for hubs, places where they can gather and have some sense of affinity with one another, problem solve, mutually come together, and then longer links that allow them to connect with the other, get resources to feed into their system that they don't actually have access to locally. And part of CUI's work has been talking about bringing back main streets which is where your bay is located, because main streets are these hubs. They're also, interestingly, forms of long links. Some main streets have long trajectories and they may change in their uh, uh, character from place to place, but they are they function as both hubs and long links. So we have at CUI tried to elevate these issues that we need to both bring back main street so you can go to bringbackmainstreet.ca and you'll see we're talking about civic assets, existing assets, and how you strengthen them. And how do we now reimagine them in different ways now that we're not going into the office as much? And do we need different things from our main streets? We think you probably do. And similarly, what's happening to our downtowns? And it's not an either or. It's not, oh, we abandoned downtowns and we only hang out at main streets. Or we all go back to trunking down to main town to downtown. It's got to be both. These things are the yin and yang of urban life. And so we've initiated this process called Restore the Core, which is a subset of Main Street, again, to have this conversation about place, existing assets, um, and how do we actually um, imagine and not waste this crisis, but imagine a new kind of adaptive reuse and a pattern of behavior that's going to strengthen ultimately local a sense of local attachment so we feel very strongly that every community across the country again neighborhoods districts large cities regions have to come together in some new kinds of collective ways to establish what are their priorities going to be and how do they build from existing assets there's going to be a lot of dough a lot of investment in the recovery. It's going to come from all sorts of sources. But I think we need to, as stewards, be stewards of our places, stewards of the relationships that we know that are important to that connective tissue piece, and try to channel those resources and leverage as much as we can. And an asset like you're sitting on with the Bay, I happen to love department stores and I love the Bays and I love the history that Canada has with this company uh, and the opportunity that it presents us. Uh, and how do we then, as we suggest, use this moment, this moment of global rethinking, extraordinary moment for those of us old enough to appreciate how unusual this is uh, to have a global moment like this. Um, how do we use that to build from the ground up? So I have two last slides and then I'm happy to just see what you guys think about this. One is this. So uh, this is a shot I took in New Orleans. Um, some of you will have seen it um, because I, just because it's so true. Uh, this is a local vendor. This is a local business, uh, Vida and Musa. They had a bike business and a, and a kayak business. They had nine feet of water and they put this sign up. This is not long after Katrina. This is maybe early 2006. You can see there's still debris out on the street. This is about the resilience of people. People will attach to place and they will cling to the bayou in New Orleans, to the rock in Newfoundland, to Portage in Maine and Winnipeg, they will hang on because they are resiliently attached because they have a sense of belonging and the importance of place. And places are resilient. And this is a beauty. And I'm gonna just do whatever I can do to encourage you to be as imaginative and as committed as you possibly can and to work with every unusual suspect, every kind of person and sector and individual and organization that you would not normally think would be interested. How do you actually reach out to them and form a nice line of joint hands to figure out how you realize the future of this place and strengthen it as we come out of this extraordinarily challenging time um, through COVID? Um, oh, one, one last slide. I have one more. This is uh, this is what I always people always say. Oh, it's too complicated. 
oh, we can't tackle this. No, 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 no. Jane had this great phrase, you know, a problem in a city is work that still needs doing. So that's where we need to be. We need to get busy. Thanks for asking me. Good luck with this event. I'm happy to be a little part of it. Thank you, Mary. That was wonderful. That was an excellent presentation. I have a couple of uh, questions um, maybe you want to address. Um, they're sort of vague, but uh, one of the questions is people in Winnipeg will not go downtown because it's deemed to be unsafe and full of social problems. So um, is that a stereotype? Is that a perception? Um, I'll let you I think answer. it's, yeah, I think it's a really important question. Um, we're doing an event, virtual event on March 4th called uh, What's the Future of Downtowns? If you go to canherb.org, sign up for our newsletter, you'll see it. I think we're announcing it today or tomorrow. And we're going to start to tackle this, conver this conversation because it's happening in downtowns across the country and around the world. The question is, of how do you actually share civic spaces? And the dilemma we've got is the services that have traditionally been in place in downtown course to support street involved and homeless folks are not able to function because of social distancing and all the constraints that COVID's placed on them. And so as you're quite rightly pointing out in certain downtown sections, and this is true across the country, it's now being dominated by one particular group. And in, in, in times prior to this, there was a more of a mix there was more kind of um, mediating involvements. You know, we want to have downtowns that are inclusive for everyone. We want to have downtowns that engage and provide amenities and services to a diverse mix of folks. That's what you want. You don't want downtowns that are only full of business suits. My God, sorry, with all respect to the business suit people, but really, that's not what we want. So you want an inclusive place. And I think that that inclusive place has to be returned, but in ways that provide the kinds of supports that we need so that downtowns become more complete neighborhoods it may well be that there weren't enough services. One of the things we're starting to see is uh, cities or municipalities are buying up hotels, which is probably long overdue to create more shelter and supportive housing for uh, street involved folks. And, uh, and I'm hopeful that we will navigate together what a kind of uh, uh, inclusive, safe for everyone downtown will look like and what would those neighborhoods need to have in amenities and so services and and components because cities are complicated places with a bunch of different kinds of folks and you want to continue to have that mix right you want to be able to be inclusive across the city and uh, so I think it's a challenge and I think even generally people coming back downtown there are other safety issues not just in terms of who's on the streets but also is transit safe and you know can I what where will I be able to uh, I can tell you a big issue is where do people use a bathroom like it's a big challenge, right? So um, all of these things have to factor into our conversation about what are we aspiring to make happen? Thank you very much. And I have one other uh, comment maybe you could address, which is a very important part of this is, will there be any level of government willing to put the tens of millions do of dollars needed into the Bay? Yeah, you know, I can't answer the specifics of this, but I can tell you that the federal um, finance committee that uh, standing committee that did the review in input into the budget, um, which, uh, uh, which Natalie Bull and others uh, have been following the National Trust have been following, it does include encouragement to create incentives for heritage buildings. So I would like to think that we will see public leadership around leveraging existing assets. The greenest building is the one that's already built uh, and that we will see public leadership from this, but it's going to need to come from the community too. Don't sit back and wait for the government to act on this. You folks need to rally, as I suggested, a whole bunch of unusual stakeholders. There's lots and lots of folks in the business community in the, in the certainly in the creative community and all these different, look for your independent small business community. And um, the dilemma we've got, you know, is that Canada's economy shifted. In the old days, we had big, huge firms like the Bay. Now we don't. And so you've got these big floor plates and big offices that don't, you have very, very few co companies or corporations that would take up obviously that much space as we know, because the Bay has been shedding floors and spaces across the country. So how do we reimagine the space? And that may be incumbent on people like us to help create the options to say, well, it could, be, it could be created this way. It could be curated that way. And what's the role of government? So I think they need instruction and encouragement. Don't wait for government to lead. We have to give some encouragement as civil society leaders about what's possible and what we expect of governments, local, federal, provincial, to engage in this. It needs to be all hands on deck on these kinds of things. And I, I wouldn't, don't set yourselves up to be you know, don't be too cynical about this. Like there is going to need to be extraordinary um, public investment to recover our urban centers post COVID. 
period. It's going to happen. So we have to make sure that we're in there trying to influence how those resources are allocated. Thank you, Mary. Um, we have time for one more question, Mary. Um, how do citizens in Winnipeg help um, inform decisions, not just to the usual suspects on the city's committee that was formed recently by the mayor? Yeah. Well, at least you have a committee, just saying. Uh, you know, that's good. And, and bravo to, uh, to Mayor Bowman for actually having a committee. Um, lots of other cities don't even create that infrastructure, so that's good. Um, well, obviously, you want to use social media and you want to use your feet. You want to use the street. You want to use vendors, you want to use people that have uh, uh, skin in the game in terms of the quality of what their uh, built environment looks like. So, uh, and I also think that, you know, there are extraordinary opportunities for us around how can these sites be, the Bay has a, has a tortured history around uh, reconciliation and the, the whole history of indigeneity. So how can you make it part of your reconciliation process? What are the First Nations communities? How are they engaging with you on this? And how do you create a kind of collective response. I think, again, you know, we have to build these things from the ground up. If, if I think of my experience in New Orleans, which is 15 years ago, but still, it really became a ground up, completely diverse coalition of, of, of commitment. And that's where I'm saying don't waste this crisis. COVID is giving you an excuse to form these kinds of bonds and really create the kinds of environments you want. So work with that committee absolutely inundate them with all the input and, and solutions you've got but at the same time appreciate that this is a bigger decision it's a bigger movement and there you've got friends across the country struggling in neighborhoods across the country all of us trying to figure this out so you've got a wonderful asset how do you build from it that was wonderful thank you i i, I do believe in in being a team player and everybody's got to work together to make this work so again on behalf of heritage winnipeg thank you very much for your wonderful presentation mary Delighted. Good luck, everybody. Nice to see you, Cindy. Thanks for asking nice me. Nice to see you. Thank you.